Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, August 18th. Our special guest today is Sharon Davison. Her topic is Teaching the Global Goals in Kindergarten. Your co-moderators are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffat, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Thanks to Tammy for doing closed captioning for us. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Maureen, who will now introduce Sharon and ask her the newbie question. Great. Thanks, Laurie. I first heard about SDGs back when I did the Better World Projects with Jennifer Garcia and her students in El Salvador. Back then, we used the UN's Millennial Goals. I'm so glad it's now SDGs. It's so much easier for me to say. Over the last several years, I started noticing Sharon's posts on social media about the incredible work she's doing with her kindergarten students, making global connections and working to make the a better world for all. So today, I'm very excited to introduce her and learn more about her work. Sharon is a passionate educator who believes in creativity and innovation. She has the privilege of being a public school teacher for over three decades. She's committed to making a difference for her students, their families, and other educators who, like herself, care and are committed to making the world better. She believes in the use of synchronous and asynchronous tools as opportunities to enhance, enrich, and connect learning opportunities. Her classroom is open globally. She creates a learning culture that is not only rich in resources, but opportunities. She, Sharon believes and advocates that collaboration around a common, with collaboration around a common need, we can all promote positive change for the world. So, Sharon, I'd like you to take the mic and answer the newbie question: What is sustainable development, and why is it important for students to learn about? Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Before I get started, I just want to do a quick shout out to my amazing friends and educators who are TEACH SDG ambassadors. Um, they are rock stars. If you want to follow some amazing teachers, go to hashtag TEACH SDGs. Um, all of these amazing people have inspired and challenged me and helped promit, uh, promote inquiry through their own curiosity about what I'm doing. So sustainable development, what is it? So as a kindergarten teacher, I really had to do a lot of reading about this in the beginning when I first started exploring sustainability with five and six-year-olds. So what I decided to do was to keep things simple. So how I explain it to my, my students is it's all about how we keep the world healthy and how we keep the world healthy without hurting it so everyone can enjoy it. And this is a really important idea, I think, regardless if you're a college professor, if you're a parent, if you're a high school teacher, because through the SDGs, we all have an opportunity to engage in positive collaborative projects to help the world remain healthy. And through these, through these goals, they offer everyone an opportunity to make the world better and sustainable. So, in, it's important also, I think, to understand this idea around sustainable development. Um, there are kind of three big ideas. They talk about social progress, economic development, and then the climate and environment. So those are really big ideas for five and six-year-olds. But one of the things that I found on the world's largest lesson is a great video that kind of talks about this very simply. So in taking this apart, I always start with social progress with my kids. Because in the beginning of the year, they're learning how to become an, uh, a community. We're developing classroom culture. So I say to them, so this idea of social progress is really simple. All it is about is how to be the best that we can be. And how do you do that? You do that by being kind. You do that by being healthy, making healthy choices. So that's a, that's a big idea, but trying to break it down for five-year-olds. And then the other piece around economic development, for me, when I was thinking about this with kids, because they're, they're young children, this is all about how things are made. So like where they come from. So when you're out purchasing something, think about, like, I wonder how that was made. How did it get here? And is it something that I really need? And then, of course, the last one, climate and environment, when I'm talking with young children, I think about explaining to them about how, 
this is all about how we're taking care of our planet. Because as a teacher, I want to explore different ecosystems. And I want my students to understand that when we explore these different ecosystems, it's important for all living things, animals and us and plants. And I think one of the things that really helped me also when I'm exploring sustainable um, uh, development with my students, especially working with young children, is I always use this example of we all want to become really independent readers. So in order to become an independent reader, you have to practice. And as you practice, you get better, you feel successful, and then you can help others also. So that was that was just another idea that I had also that I used. Great, thank you. And now you can go on with your presentation. Okay. So on this slide, I have a video that will play in just a moment. Um, this is a video that I created last year with my students, and it's important to understand this is this will be my third year exploring exploring the global goals with five and six year olds. And so one of the things that I think is really important is this idea of why. Young children really need to understand not only what they're doing, but why is this important. And through, in the very beginning, I really try to be intentional and explicit about what it is that we're doing. And through that, I try to, when kids have questions about things that we're exploring, I, I really try to be respectful and listen to what their question is because that's something that they're curious about. And because they're curious, they will then become passionate about finding some kind of answer or solution. So if you want to go ahead and just play the video. I explore the global goals for sustainability in kindergarten alongside my students because the world needs everybody to care, to care about what are the things that we're going to do to help make our planet sustainable so that people today, tomorrow, and later on can enjoy. The global goals because to help the planet. Learn about the global goals to be kind to each other. Learn people to know about the global goals so the world stays healthy. To be a better place because the world won't get, the world won't die. If people throw trash on the ground, then the earth won't like that, but then the global goals will help because if people know about the global goals, then we can help the world. I want people to know about the global goals because, so everybody knows about the global goals, because then if nobody knows about the the global goals, then um, if everybody was throwing trash on the ground, the world would die. Awesome. I want them to know about the global goals so the world doesn't die and they don't like to trash on the ground and they don't like to fight. I want people to know about the global goals because if people don't, if people know about the global goals, then they can tell other people about the global goals. And then everybody will know about the global goals and nobody will throw trash on the ground and then the world won't die. I want people to know about the global goals because if nobody knows about the global goals, then the world won't be helped and then the world will just die. People should know about the global goals because it helps the world. People should know about the global goals so because if someone wants something, you can just chill, kind of. I want people to know about the global goals. Because everything in the world is connected, just like a house part is connected all to each other. And if one part is just slipped away, a big thing can, a big bad thing can just happen suddenly when you don't want it. And so how does that connect to the goals? Because that's how it is with the earth. Just in, with the global goals in the earth, that's a, if we didn't have the global goals, it would be sort of like a house with no sports and it would be like... I want people to learn about the global goals so then more people will. So then um, they'll know about it. So then they'll start doing it and then 
the world will be able to stay alive longer. People to know um, about the goal, goal goals because that's how it helps the world. I want people um, to know about the global goals because it helps the world. I want people to know about the global goals because they help the world. And if more people know about the global goals, the more the people that will help the world. I want people to know about the global goals so they help the world. So I like starting with that video because it gives everyone kind of an idea about what can happen when you do begin to explore the global goals with your students. They start to make authentic connections with things that they're doing in the classroom. So just to give you an idea about how this all begins, in the beginning, um, the first thing that I do is I take a globe and I have it out and I have it in my arm, you know, my hands and I show my students and I ask them to tell me if you know what this is. And they're like, oh, that's the world, that's the world, that's where we live, we live in the world. I'm like, absolutely, absolutely. And I show them where we are and I let them know we live on a continent, we're in North America. And I tell them that all of this other blue stuff is water. So we have lots of different continents and water that make up the planet. And I said, so one of the things that I'm thinking about is, I wanted to ask everyone a question. I asked them to raise your hand if you've ever been sick before. And of course, kids raise their hands. And then I asked for them to turn and talk with each other to talk about what do you do when you're sick, when you don't feel well? What do you do when you're hungry? What do you do? Just to get them thinking about this idea and perspective of, you know, who helps them? What do they do? So after we're done having that discussion, I then can, I share out their ideas and then I say to them, so when you're sick, when I'm sick, I say, I usually stay home, I stay in my bed, I wrap myself up, I keep myself warm, and then I start to feel better. So when we're thinking about the world and the global goals, I let them know that the goals are the blanket that wrap themselves around the world that the goals are what take care of the planet. And I let them know that we are all going to be ambassadors. We are going to be modeling for ourselves inside and outside of our classroom on how people can help take care of the world. When I, and I do this on the first take. So one of the, one of the really great things about young children is they are jazzed for solutions. Like there, if there's a problem, they want to make, they want to find solutions like right away. So the first thing that I do is I create a, a list of wishes for the world. And this can be a permanent artifact in your classroom. If you have older children, you know, they might be able to come up with their own personal list. List, but in kindergarten, I do everything. Um, I have a smart board, so I'll put it on that and then um, take a picture and put it next to my board. Because what I want to do is I want to get their ideas. What are their ideas about how can we make the world better? So these were just some of the ideas that the children came up with. And what I do then is I keep this list next to the board and it's there for the year. And then what we do as we explore different ideas inside kindergarten, I'll refer to this list. And then next to the list, I also have a big poster of the global goals. And I'll, let, I'll remind them again that all of these ideas that we have, that everyone is sharing, these are all global goals. These are all our ideas are going to help make the world better. And the kids really great to get this. And I think this is really important, even on the first day of school, because what I'm trying to do is to create a culture, a culture for learning. And it's really, really important that kids feel a part of that culture and that we try to find ways to enhance their, their voices about their ideas about what they want to pursue. And I think that along with this, once you've done that, even like the first and second day of school, I have a big um, map that um, I've had help with kind of outlining the continents. And on the first and second day of school, kindergarten, I have, I invite parents to come in, a couple of parents, and they paint the world. And the reason that I do this, I do this for lots of different reasons. But again, I'm trying to build this culture. I'm trying to 
help children create and develop a perspective that it's not just us in our classroom, but we are a part of a much bigger picture, a much bigger world. And the parents come in and we paint the continents, we paint the oceans, and then I teach them this great song called The Continent Song. Um, I'll try to share that also with people. And then what happens is the kids start to understand, oh, we're going to be learning, we're going to be making friends with people in different parts of the world. And so then this big map becomes an artifact, a permanent artifact in my classroom. Because what we do is we add to this map, you know, not every day, but every week as we make different connections with different people. Because one of the things that's really, really important is to be transparent about what we're learning and then how we're learning it. And for me, this all started a long time ago. Um, there was a gentleman um, who's part of this, Steve, um, this organization. And he talked a lot about the importance of having conversations. And through those conversations that you have with people, you make connections and they become meaningful. And then through those meaningful connections, you're able to develop relationships that can turn into more learning and also more collaborative opportunities. So in my classroom, I want to make sure that my children are understanding how we're having conversations with other people. So are we using Padlet, Twitter, Google, Hangout, Skype? What are we doing? And then where in the world are we having those conversations? So in the map, you'll see just some beginnings. Um, we use Padlet in the beginning of the year. We connected with a class um, in India um, where we will, were able to do a whole focus around zero hunger. I made another connection with a kindergarten class in Hong Kong. And because of the time difference, we only use Padlet, but again, what I'm able to do then is screenshot those conversations and put them on the map with the children and talk to them. So again, what we're trying to do is to create this idea of a learning culture. There are other people that we can learn from. And then um, there's these great global goal glasses that the kids make also in the beginning of the year, which they just love, um, to highlight themselves also as ambassadors. And I have parents come in and help with that also. And that's also on the world's largest lesson. And the other thing that we do early on in the year is I create a map key for this map as well, which shows where people were born, where they travel to, and then where their family might be from. And we use different geometric shapes, so that's another nice connection with, you know, two-dimensional um, shapes in terms of our own learning in kindergarten. Um, so that's a nice way also. And again, then we can kind of look at, look at that as data and say, oh, what does this tell us? The other thing that's really important to think about, too, is when we're creating these invitations to learn, I want to make sure that I'm always inviting families and former students and other people as well that have been in kindergarten. Because this whole idea of when we're exploring the global goals, you want to think about opportunities where you're making trails with your kids and you're building, you're building bridges to further learn from each other. There's no right or wrong way to explore the goals, um, which I love about this because they're relevant to everyone. And so another piece that I try to explore a lot in my classroom in the very beginning is this idea of language and how are we encouraging children to have conversations. So it, I really want to be careful about not eliciting to have yes or no or right or wrong conversations, but more conversations about um, using the word I, like I notice. I wonder, I observed. And when we're using language like this, even after the first few days of kindergarten, children pick this up. Um, I've had a lot of, um, you know, diversity in my classroom, a lot of, a lot of, you know, some children who don't speak to children with lots of different languages. And these statements, I statements, really seem to be successful for everybody because it gets at the thinking behind what do you have to say. And then it also gives young children an opportunity to really expand on their oral language, which as we know for young kids, that's where they're going to learn the most is when they're talking. The other thing that I created uh, just a year ago was one of the things I was thinking about when I'm creating a culture for learning is to think about five C's. And 
So in the beginning, whenever I'm doing all of my planning, I'm really thinking a lot about am I offering opportunities to have conversations with each other and how it, what does that look like and sound like? Are children allowed to share their ideas and be creative? Um, are they able to ask questions that promote um, curiosity? Are there opportunities where they are actually collaborating with each other? And then this idea of celebration. And this is really, really important for me, as I'm sure it is for a lot of teachers. Um, as a teacher, the heart of my work is with my students. And the heart of my work comes from when children are able to celebrate and talk about what they understand and what they know. And so one of the things that I do is I have at least five different celebrations a year where I invite parents to come into the classroom, usually in the morning from starting at like 7.30. That way it's really easy for families to stop by on their way to work. And then they can look around the room and see the kinds of things that the children are involved in. So one of the really cool things that happens too when we're thinking about um, creating a culture for learning is I, last year, this was really eye-opening for me. Last year, I think it was like the second week of school, one of my students said, Mrs. D, I think we need to have goal six by the sink. And I said, why? I said, let me read it to you, because we have not talked about that. I said, it's clean water and sanitation. Do you know what that means? So we talked about it. And he said, I, he said, I think we need it by the sink, because then that will remind people not to waste water. I was like, oh, OK, awesome. So now we have that goal above our sink every year. Then the other thing that happened, we with goal 12, one of my kids liked the design, and they said, Mrs. D, that looks like an eight. And um, can you tell us about that one? And I said, sure. I said, it's all about waste and, and responsible consumption and production, production, excuse me, means waste. So this is about thinking about like what we need and then what we buy. Because if we buy a lot of things, like at snack time, that has a lot of plastic, we have to think about where does that plastic go? Does it go into the landfill? Does it go into the recycle bucket? So again, the children said, well, we should put that over by the trash and the recycle bucket. And I said, absolutely, that would serve as a good reminder. And then the other thing that happened is a lot of kids came with these little snacks that had the little plastic lids and tops on top of. So one of the children decided to, we should collect those, and then we can use them to count for math. So again, when we're thinking about this with our kids, this is all very authentic. And again, this is what it looks like and sounds like how it's evolved in my classroom. But how it might look, look in your classroom may be very different, and that's OK. That's what's so great about the global goal. So these are just some quick photographs so you can kind of see what happened. Um, in terms of our own learning culture, what we put up for the children. Um, we, along with our trash, and I'll get into this as one of our service learning opportunities, um, because we made a, a local connection. Um, she, the woman came in, Recycle Rhonda, and she was able to give us a little card where the kids could put their little stickers on it before they actually put things in the compost or the trash, and it was great. Now, the other thing, too, that happens when you're creating this culture is you have to think about, you know, I'm always thinking about what is the impact? Like, how do I know that the work that I'm doing is really making a difference? So I use things like Google Forms sometimes or, you know, um, to ask parents. I'll interview students independently also. But one of the tools, the platforms that I use a lot of is Twitter. And some parents have joined Twitter over the years just so that they can interact during a day with us. Um, parents know they don't have to be on Twitter to read the tweets. But this is what happens. So here's an example of a couple of parents who have been following our blog and, and looking at a lot of the work that we've been doing online and saying, wow, you know, they're, they're doing um, shapes. So a couple of parents took pictures of things in the natural wor world and then posted the picture with a question to us. 
so what this does is this makes that curricular connection. It's another way that I'm modeling, coming back to this idea of conversations, it's another way that I'm modeling how we're having conversations with other people in regards to things that we're, that we're learning. So this is a really, really important idea. And then also, how is it impacting? So Recycle Rhonda, as I mentioned earlier, who is with the Chittenden Solid Waste District in our state, has come into our school now for four years. And she does all these incredible workshops with the kids around waste. And so that connects really well with Global Goal um, 13, Climate Action, and 15, Life on Land. So when she comes in now, we are able to ask her questions using Twitter. And my students a couple years ago, she was not on Twitter. So my five and six-year-olds had an opportunity to teach her how to use Twitter. So now she's on Twitter. So again, this is how we're able to continue our learning with someone, a real expert. And it doesn't take long. Um, she's able, we're able to ask a question or share with her. So here, you know, one of the tweets was she had come back to teach us about flip floppy plastic. And I, that was all new for me. So we told her we had a full box and she said she'd come back and check in. So she's great. She's giving us positive feedback and she'll be back to keep, you know, she'll come pick it up. And then reinforcing this idea of keep up the great work, which is really important too, right? So then the other piece that I'm thinking a lot about are the service learning opportunities uh, that can come up as well. So this, uh, this last year I was certified um, as a National Geographic educator and through one of the webinars that I was involved with, I learned a little bit more about service learning. I had always referred to work that I had done as community service, which what I'm, I found out is really community service is all about volunteering. The service learning is, is a, more of a pro, an approach, an educational approach to, to, that includes specific learning goals or targets with a community service project. And then I think on top of that, it's also an opportunity for you to work alongside your students and your families to help them learn how to become advocates, to help advocate for a change. Um, so one of the things that we did is we really focused a lot on zero hunger. And this was a little thank you note that we got from our local food drive um, person at our, our food shelf. And so this was really powerful for the kids also because she did not know about the global goals. So we visited there just a couple of times uh, last year and my students were able to give her her own poster that she's now hanging in the food shelf and they were able to educate her about what the global goals are and why they're important. So again, it's important to think about how can you tie this in in your classroom, in your school, thinking about what are those opportunities that exist in your local community. And then once you find those local communities that are, you know, that you can pursue these ideas with, then you can make them global. And then what happens, the really awesome thing that happens is my students then become mentors. They're the children, they're five and six years of age, but they're teaching other people about the global goals and what they're learning. So this was really great also. These were a couple of pictures. We went two different times uh, to the food shelf last year. Um, I've included also in this list a book list because one of the things that I found as a teacher when I was doing a lot of the service learning this last year is trying to find specific um, books that would be really, really helpful um, for me um, and for my age group. So I did create a book list. It is in the links, and I think also the world's lesson also has it, and it's also on the Teach the SDGs website. And I will continue to add books to that as I go on. But anyway, this was this is a perfect example um, as far as the learning goals. You have specific learning goals. You want to explore how, with your students how they can advocate for others who need food. What are some things that they can do together? What are some actions that they can do to help advocate? Because there are a lot of people in Vermont where I live and all over the world. Poverty, I mean, not poverty, um, hunger is still a problem. 
um, food insecurity exists. And a lot of children, a lot of families are at risk for food insecurity. So even thinking about that and thinking about the age group that you work with, there's so many possibilities. The other thing that we did as well with this is these are more like another curricular um, connection. I used, uh, I've been using KidBlog for a lot of years and I, I really like that platform. Um, these were some posts that my kids con um, created in the middle of the year after the holidays. And so what they did is we read a really great story called Maddie's Fridge. And if you don't know that book, you should get it. It's an appropriate story for preschool through college. And it has a great message in it. Um, anyway, so the children are able to reflect on the characters in the story, who is your favorite character and why, and then to write a response about that. And again, this is just a quick example of how you can get at some of those common core standards as well, that um, depending on where you are. Um, in the world if you're required to explore them or not. Um, another piece also is this local community connection. And again, as I, recycle, as I mentioned, Recycle Rhonda is someone who's very familiar in our school. And so one of the things that she shared on Twitter is she shared a picture of a giraffe from another school that she had visited that had created an animal, a giraffe, out of recycled plastic. So she tweeted this and we noticed it. And so we asked her a question about it. And she got back to us. And so then what we did is, um, I don't know if you would like a Michaels, it's like a Walmart or something, where they have these canvas boards that are not very expensive. So what I did is I had a parent kind of outline the global goal. Um, and then the children went through with the plastic that we had co um, collected. And then the kids just glued it on. And then all the space in between, um, they just painted it that color. So now we have these two artifacts that we can hang outside of our classroom. And the kids were very, very proud of this. And then they wanted to share this with Recycle Rhonda because she's now a familiar face in our classroom. She's a, a local community person, a connection that we've made a connection with. And they know that she's interested in their learning. So this is how we're sharing our learning with her and how we're having conversations. And then, again, just reiterating this whole idea about how are these conversations happening. These are a list of all of the synchronous and asynchronous tools that I have been using. Um, this year, I will be using Seesaw more than I have been in the past. But again, this is important to think about because it's not about the technology for me. It's always about the learning. And how are these platforms encouraging and supporting me and my students so that I can share my voice, the voice of my parents, and the voice of my students? Because once we do that globally, it just opens up your room. The children are just naturally jazzed and inspired. And they have lots and lots of questions. And I think this is really great, especially for kindergarten, because they love to talk. And they should be talking all the time, because that's how they're going to, that's how they're making sense and understanding things that they're exploring. So one of the things that we've done is I've used Padlet. If you don't know about it, um, you definitely want to check it out. It's a great free online um, tool. It's like a giant sticky note. So again, when I'm showing this with my five and six year old, I hold up a pad of post-it notes. And I'm like, we talk about what it is. We use those for making tracks in our book or writing notes. And I said, it's the same kind of thing, except we do this virtually. We can put it on our blog, and then we can share it with other people in the world. So on um, this Padlet, I think we had three or four uh, continents that were represented um, on this Padlet about what, what do you do with your waste. And so again, this goes up on the wall. If you remember seeing that map that I shared with you um, on the first slide, um, it, I take pictures of this. The kids put it up on the map on the wall. So we have that kind of artifact in our room to remind us of what, who we're connecting with, how we're connecting with them. And then we also have that other artifact, that other chart that we have next to the global goals. So we go back and revisit that often too and saying, whoa, so waste, where, where does this fit in? 
you know, to our questions. Gee, it kind of ties in with maybe everybody cares about each other because we're taking care of the world. So again, we're always going back and making connections with what we're doing. And again, this is another um, Padlet that I used also this last year about what does forest look like where you live? And again, it's a very open-ended question. So for those of you that um, are exploring the next generation science standards, there's your science content right there. Um, and one of the really cool things that happened with this is that the children all understood that no matter where a tree grew in the world, it could be, an, we had um, someone contribute from Egypt, from Australia, from South America, from all over the place. So they decided that no matter where a tree grows, they need a seed, seed soil, sun, and water. But my students then came up with a fifth thing. They said, Mrs. D, they also need care. People have to care about trees in order for them to grow. And I thought this was really amazing. And this was so eye-opening for me because the, these are five and six-year-olds. And they're, they're thinking about this. So they're already starting to explore this idea of empathy. How can we have empathy for others, empathy for other living things? This is really, really important. And again, this is another way of how we're having conversations with others and how we're sharing our learning. The other thing is, is, you know, think about in your own communities where you are, your own local and global experts. You know, we had AmeriCorps come. I ended up doing a Skype session with a real-life forest ranger um, in Yellowstone National Park, and that was really cool. Um, and again, you know, the lady who visited us from AmeriCorps, she actually, she didn't know about the global goal, so my kids around a bird, um, advocacy project, they presented posters to her that they created, and then they taught, to her, taught her about the goals, and then she created um, how birds connect to the global goals. So that was kind of a cool thing, too. And then thinking about the impact and awareness of our actions. So this is really important for families. So in one of the photos, you'll see one of my former students with her grandparents. So they decided to make pictures and books and donate them to children who didn't have books. And then on the right, another student of mine, um, just over a year ago, um, she was traveling with her family in Texas, and it was her idea to go to the state park and pick up trash. And so her parents looked at the global goals, and they said, well, what global goal do you think this connects with? So again, I think once you connect this with your kids. Once you make this real for them, um, they are going to take hold and they are going to make connections and they're, they're the ambassadors for the change. Here was an initiated parent project last year. Um, we were part of an everyday kindness project through an amazing teacher in Vietnam, um, amazing teacher. And he started this everyday kindness project. And so from that, um, a parent, again, because they, were, they knew that we were involved with this Everyday Kindness Project, um, decided, Mrs. D, do you know about these friendship rocks? So this is great. So my kids all made rocks. And the whole idea is, is that when you walk around the school, if you find a rock, it brings someone a smile, and then someone else will pick it up and give it to someone else who needs it. Um, and again, you know, thinking about children as mentors, too, is really, really important. Whenever I present, I try to have my children present. And the reason that I do this is because if I, they can't be there physically, then I try to use Skype or another way. Because once children grab a hold of this idea about they're there to save the world, they're confident. So here are a couple of pictures of some students last year who went to other classrooms in our school to present about the global goals and gave them all their own global goal sign. And then last year, I was invited to present myself and another kindergarten teacher at our school who also was new to our school and um, also started exploring the global goals as well. We presented together at a kindergarten conference in our state to 40 pre-K through kindergarten teachers, and we brought six students with us. And this was really valuable also because the students were there as well as the parents. And they all had opportunities to be involved with why it's important to explore, explore the global goals. And there's nothing more valuable than that. Um, at the very end, you know, I always think about, you know, being ambassadors for the world. And it, this is a great opportunity for teachers to explore this idea of empathy. 
and help your students develop a wide perspective and a global audience and and what are they doing at home and what are they doing in their in their local community and how are they making a difference um, I have a lot of resources here um, pledges that I've created with my kids global gold books a passport for learning that we've used um, also books and how I've organized them as well that's all part of the resources um, there are a couple more videos, but I'm not going to play them, but I am going to encourage you um, to listen to them, especially the one on the left. Um, that was work that we had done um, a few years ago around collecting food for the food shelf when I was not aware of what service learning was. And another school used our video at an assembly for over 700 students to help kickstart um, a food uh, drive in their school. So again, it's five and six year olds being mentors and um, leading the way. There are lots of global opportunities as well that I've listed. I do want to do a big shout out for the Global Project Looking 2020 project. Um, an amazing teacher, Mark Reed um, from Canada, is our big, he's the big guy behind this. Um, but this project that he's created or put together. There are a lot of us that are what we're calling project ambassadors. And so it's over 17 months. And so teachers have an opportunity to kind of celebrate and share the things that you're doing in your classroom according to a, a specific goal. So every month there's a new goal. So you can go through and look at that. I would really love to see some of you contribute to that. Um, and then there's just lots and lots of resources, lots and lots of resources. Um, and this was one slide that I put together for the Looking 2020 project. And really, it's for me, it's all about thinking, like thinking about a local global need. How am I going to engage my students in conversations about sustainability? How am I inviting people to participate? And never underestimate ever, ever the value of your students and their voices. And to remember that kids, no matter how old they are, they can create positive plans for sustainability. Thanks so much, Sharon. I think everybody learned quite a bit today. I know. Sorry, I was talking really fast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the only comment, it wasn't really a question, that I captured in chat. I, I captured it because I'm not sure you're going to uh, go back and read the entire chat log. And this came from Maureen. Uh, she said she met the mayor of Montpelier, Vermont, this summer at a conference. And she suggested that you ought to connect with her to get more high school kids on board. And oh, Watson wonderful. teaches physics, I think, as well as being mayor. Oh, awesome. So that that's in the moderators tab. Does anyone have any questions for Sharon? You know, one of the things I um, did not mention, um, well, I think I have in different ways, but there are lots of reasons um, why we want to step up and really think about how we can explore sustainable development goals. Because I think about things like climate, mm -hmm. um, poverty, um, also hunger, um, thinking about energy, you know, is that throughout our world. I mean, those in and of itself, just those four big ideas would be reasons enough for anybody really just to begin exploring them. And I and I feel like in kindergarten, I, I've really been, I have learned a lot. And I think the Global Goals have also helped me learn alongside my students and families every year, every year. And there are things that we learn from people, but I think when you're learning alongside your students, you're learning alongside someone, you're going through those ahas and stuff at the same time. And it's very, very powerful, very powerful. I do have a couple questions now. Um, can you tell us more about becoming an ambassador? So right now, they are. there's two cohorts. Um, they are looking for a third cohort um, if you go on to the Teach the SDGs website. So if you're interested in applying to be an ambassador, I would encourage people to do so, um, especially if you are already engaged with this work. Um, I think it's also important, there is no right or wrong way to explore the goals. 
for me, you know, I'm, I'm as a learner, as a person, I'm kind of like, I'm going to jump right in the deep water and just do it and figure it out. <laughs> um, so that's kind of my style, but not everybody, you don't have to have that style in order to be successful with these goals. Even if you just take one goal, um, even if you're thinking about, you know, maybe we're just going to be ambassadors, we're just going to be partners with the goals, and so all of our actions are going to be kind, safe, and responsible. Those are our rules at our school, so um, that's really applicable to that. Um, you can do as much or as, as little as you want, but I will tell you what happens is that once your children become aware of the goals and once they start making these connections authentically through real service learning opportunities and in the school, they will start making connections. Um, for example, I had never done um, goal three before. I'd never really focused on it until this last year. It's good health and well-being because one of my little boys said, Mrs. D, when we're being mindful, when we're taking, you know, body, when we're doing body breathing, that's what we're doing. We're supporting that goal because we need to take a break. And I was like, oh, my gosh. So there are some amazing things that can happen, amazing things. So I encourage everyone just to give it a go. And that actually answers the question I was about to ask, and that was where where would you encourage teachers to start? Um, and, and I think even just having the poster up in your room and even, you know, my example um, about how the goals are a way that's like a blanket that wraps around the world. That's how, you know, we take care of the world. The goals take care of the world. I mean, use that or depending on the age group that you're working with. Mm -hmm. You know, I know for middle school and high school, they're doing a lot more um, maybe work with sustainability or thinking about it, so there might be more opportunities for them to choose a goal that they would mm -hmm. want to pursue. Um, because what happens is then other people become interested. So now um, I've made this great connection with a high school teacher in our district, and for two years now, at the end of the year, my students go to his classroom where he has juniors and seniors in high school, and we present our video that we create, and we talk about sustainability, and then we listen to his kids talk to us about their sustainable projects, and then we go visit their outdoor classroom. So it, it's just, it's amazing. Lots of opportunities happen. Terrific. Um, I don't see any other questions in chat. Does anyone else have a question for Sharon? Or would anyone like to share how they teach about the global goals? You can get on the mic, raise your hand first, and we'll give you the mic. Okay, Marie, go ahead. Okay, well, I'm not in the classroom right now because I'm doing um, a few other things. But when I did uh, the Millennium Goals, what we did, I did it with sixth grade, and I had students work in groups. They each chose a goal, researched it, and had to create a video about it and talk about what, what the problem is and some possible solutions. One of the things that um, was difficult at that time, it was during the AIDS ap epidemic in Africa, and that was, I talked to some, several parents because their children had chosen that as their topic. So that was a little touchy. A lot of things around uh, women's rights and hearing about um, the way women are treated around the world is difficult for my students. It, you know what, Peggy? I just looked for that, for the link, and um, Jennifer had that on Wikispaces, and I don't see it. I could ask Jennifer if she put it someplace else, but it was a wiki. But yeah, it was a great project to do. The kids, aside from all the, like, the tech skills, research skills, all that, they learned a lot, and the empathy was pretty amazing. And that's what I, I was, I'm excited to do this with younger students. I think it's a really great project to do. Thanks, Marie. I'm going to turn over the mic to Peggy, who will tell us what's coming up next. 
Well, I can't thank you enough, Sharon, for the awesome ideas you've given us, the examples, the stories, and all of the amazing resources. And I'm so glad that we have them all together in one place in the Live Binder so people can go back and check them out, explore them, sign up for uh, upcoming projects, and share them out. We would love to hear more about them. And thank you, Maureen, for taking the mic and for sharing your experience with us. If any of you have any links that you would like to share, please put them in the chat, and I will add them to the live binder. Today's announcement of upcoming shows is a little bit different than our regular upcoming shows, and it's a little bit long, so I hope that you'll hang in with me for this announcement. You are all our very special friends and supporters on Classroom 2 Live, and we so appreciate your participation with us every week. Many of you have been with us for the entire nine and a half years since we began back in 2009. But today, I have some sad news to announce. After lots of soul searching, Many conversations among our co-moderators, our advisory team members, and Steve Hargadon, we have decided that the time has come to retire our live webinars. We have made so many great connections, both with presenters and participants, and we've really enjoyed being able to provide so many outstanding, timely shows that have helped all of us to learn many ways to integrate technology into our classrooms and our professional lives. While we love what we've been able to do, and we especially value the extensive live binders that continue to be a valuable resource to use and share, we have concluded that what we're doing is no longer really unique, and we're unable to compete with the incredible number of similar opportunities that are available for free for educators. Over the past six months, we've been concerned that we've basically plateaued out with a fairly low number of participants each week, but very valuable, important participants. But we haven't been able to increase the number of participants. And when we invite presenters to spend their time to share their expertise and passions with us, we're disappointed that we can't provide an audience large enough to make it worth their while. We explored many alternatives to consider what we could change. We discussed switching to an alternative platform, changing to a monthly show, shortening the show to 30 minutes, changing the day from Saturdays, changing the format to maybe something like an open mic format where we would discuss topics and share resources rather than having presentations, among other ideas. We know it's been a challenge for new participants to struggle with the login demands of Blackboard Collaborate. But that's just one of the factors. In the end, we concluded that it has been an incredible run, but that it's time for us to retire the live show. Our website, our archived recordings and live binders will continue to be available to everyone. And we know our friendships and connections with all of you and people around the world will continue. So we're going to hold one final webinar next week, August 25th, where we would like to have a last hurrah celebration and hold an open mic session similar to our anniversary celebrations. We hope all of you will join us and invite your friends and plan to take the mic to share your favorite memories and some of the shows that really made a difference to you, maybe with some stories about you've used, how you've used something you learned on Classroom 2.0 Live in your classrooms or your professional lives. 
Whether you were a participant or a presenter, we'd love to hear your stories and takeaways from the show and the resources you learned about. So thank you all for being such faithful followers and supporters of Classroom 20 Live, and I hope we'll see you next week. Thanks. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargett on its latest. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place, including host your own webinar where you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate session. And as long as it's open to the public, it's free. You can access the video collection on iTunes U, as well as YouTube. As you exit this session, you can request a professional development certificate in the survey. It's at the bottom of the survey, and it prints out your name. And thanks to Patty Russing for getting these out. Please make sure this is a personal email address and not a school email address. Schools tend to block these from getting to you. This is the direct link for the survey, but you can take that from the live binder as well or from the chat. Special thanks to Sharon Davison, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, the future of education and the learning revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in this show today. Thanks so much for coming.